Hey friends, Pastor Thomas here. Um, today I am starting something with this video, something I hope you'll enjoy. Um, I'm going to be starting a series of online Bible studies. Now we're not going, it's not going to be the Zoom studies maybe you've participated in, but rather these are going to be me recording some of these videos and then sharing them through Facebook and YouTube, and hopefully giving an opportunity for you to watch those at your leisure um, whenever you have time. And so while it is be talking and we can't be interactive as we would through Zoom, one of the things I am encouraging everyone to do is to email me any questions or comments you have, and I can share those as we go. I want to be able to make this as interactive as possible as we go forward. So sort of an approach to what we're going to do with these is we're going to be over the next few days, maybe even weeks, sort of working our way through the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew is the main gospel in this year's lectionary cycle that we're using in worship. If you don't know what the lectionary is, it is a three-year cycle of readings that's used across many denominations where we cover a large portion of the Bible over a three-year period. There's always, for most Sundays in the, in a, the lectionary year, there is a gospel reading, an Old Testament reading, a New Testament reading that's not one of the Gospels, and a psalm. And so Matthew is the main Gospel reading for the year that we are currently in, and so that's what we're going to be doing in this study. Uh, today, uh, before we jump into the text itself, I'm going to be giving some introductory uh, stuff about Matthew, and we'll go through that, and then in our next series, we'll actually begin with chapter one, verse one. We'll sort of work our way through the book together. I'm really excited about this, and I hope that you will be too, and I hope this is a way that we can uh, be church together in continuing unusual times. But before we begin, let's pray together. Almighty God, as we come before uh, to your word, Lord, we ask that you open our hearts and minds that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we might hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. So friends, today, I want to offer a word, some words of introduction about the Gospel of Matthew to say where did this Gospel come from and how did we get it and what does it all mean? I always like to share sources with you um, when I do something like this. And the most important source is going to be the Bible itself. And what can we learn about the Gospel of Matthew from the Gospel of Matthew? So uh, a good Bible is going to be the most important thing you need for this process. But there are some other things I'm using. For example, uh, the New Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible is a great resource and uh, one I use a great deal. Sort of, It's sort of the Encyclopedia Britannica of the Bible. Not really a commentary series, but a good way to uh, just learn a little bit more about some specific uh, concrete areas of the Bible. So you could look up Matthew and see what it has to say about Matthew, but at the same time, if it has some word that you don't know what it means, like say uh, you want to learn about oil lamps in the New Testament, you can read about oil lamps in the New Testament. A couple of commentary series I also lean pretty heavily on and really get a lot out of. Uh, one is the Ancient Christian Commentary on Scripture, and so this is one that I use a great deal uh, that is sort of a collection of sayings from uh, ancient fathers and mothers of the church. And then sort of a standard work for mainline Christian uh, theology and reading of Scripture is one I also rely on quite heavily, and that's the New Interpreter's Bible. It is a multi-volume lectionary series and one I really enjoy. This one is in our church library, as is the, uh, the New Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible. Uh, so once we're able to do things in person again, maybe you'll want to come up to the library and take advantage of those. So let's talk about Matthew. Just as some words of introduction, where does the Gospel of Matthew come from? And in a sense, what is a gospel? The first four books of the Old Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are we call the Gospels. They are the books of the Bible that tell the story of Jesus' life. And they each have their own distinctive things about them. But if we're talking about Matthew, uh, which we will, but let's talk first about, as a whole, where did the Gospels come from? How did we get these four books of the Bible that tell the story of Jesus' life and ministry on earth? 
Uh, some commentators have broken the Gospels down into sort of three areas that they pull from. Historical events, verbal tradition, and then that which is redacted or edited. Start with the first one, historical events. There's some things uh, about the life of Jesus that whether you believe that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God and God in the flesh, whether you believe those or not, whether you're a Christian or not, there's some things that historically speaking, we can say with a degree of certainty. For example, a man named Jesus of, from Nazareth existed. Now that we can preclude the miracles, we can say that he was nothing more than a great teacher. But historically speaking, most historical scholars, whether they're Christian or not, would say that Jesus of Nazareth was a real person. So we have a historicity of Jesus, but there are also some things that most scholars would say that would serve as maybe historical building blocks for the story of Jesus. For example, he was born. Everybody that ever lived was born. Now, there are some things about Jesus as Messiah, as Son of God, that have been added to the story of his birth, but he was born. We can also be sure that he died. It seems that whether we agree with the Christian claims about Jesus or not, that this real man that really existed, Jesus of Nazareth, was crucified by the Roman authorities, especially, particularly under Pontius Pilate. We know that from biblical sources outside, well, I'm not from biblical sources rather, but from historical sources outside of the Bible. So there are some historical things, for example, we can say with certainty probably happened. But then there's the verbal traditions, the things, the stories about Jesus that were passed around and the, before the gospels were written down, the stories that people told about Jesus and went from person to person and became part of the church's collective memory. So that is a source, that is part of where the Gospels came from. And then the third place, source, or the, not source is not the right word here necessarily, but the third place, I should say, of how the Gospels were produced by the work of the redactor, the person who collected the stories, compiled them, and sat down with these historical things about Jesus or these verbal sayings of Jesus and said, how do I put these together into a narrative that makes sense? So three sort of places, I'm not going to use the word sources because we're going to talk about sources in a minute as something different, but sort of three rises of the Gospels, the historical events, the verbal traditions about Jesus, and then the work of the redactor or editor. And each of the four Gospels is distinctive. And, and even though they're distinctive, even though they tell the story of the same, made, same Savior, think of their distinctiveness in this way. If you or I see something happen, say we see a car wreck, and the police ask us to describe what we saw, three of us there together, he pulls me to the side, and I say, well, I saw this, 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 and this, and I noticed that this man had on a hat and this man had on a red shirt. And then he pulls, the police officer pulls you to the side, and he or she asks you to describe the same event. You would be describing the same event, but maybe you would describe a different person, or maybe you would remember a car differently. Maybe you would notice something about this car that I didn't notice, or this person that that didn't notice. And then the police officer pulls the third person to the side, and that he or she asks that person to, set, to describe what he or she saw, and they describe something completely different than what any of us saw. They notice details that we didn't notice, telling the same story, describing the same event, but using different distinctive things to tell that same story. When we think of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we can think of them in that way. Three, diff four different people describing the same events, describing the life of Jesus, but in their own way with their own distinctive things about it. If we think about how the Gospel of Matthew is related to the other Gospels, we can look at it in this way. Traditionally, the church considered Matthew to be the oldest Gospel. But modern scholarship seems to show maybe something different is going on. It seems that Mark was the first Gospel written. Most scholars would agree that Mark was the first Gospel written and that Matthew and Luke 
together or are redactions or retellings of the Gospel of Mark. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all follow the same storyline or the same rather timeline of Jesus' ministry. John presents a slightly different timeline. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke agree on the basic timeline of Jesus' ministry. That some scholars call that the Markan spine. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke seem to be related to one another. They are often called the synoptic gospels to describe how the three of them are related. So then one source for Matthew would be Mark. It's as if the author of Matthew sat down with the gospel of Mark and said, how do I retell this story in a way that fleshes things out a little bit more? So Mark is one of the sources for Matthew. But there's also material in the Gospel of Luke that's also in the Gospel of Matthew, but not in the Gospel of Mark. So it would seem that there's a common source between Matthew and Luke, but not Mark. This common source between Matthew and Luke is sometimes called Q, an abbreviation for quell, a German word that means question. But it's unknown. There, and when we talk about the Q source, we're not talking about some book some issue, some, uh, some gospel writing that has been misplaced, but rather a, co a set of shared traditions and stories that we hypothetically call Q that both Matthew and Luke pulled from. And then there's material that's unique to Matthew's gospel that's neither in Mark nor Luke. So sort of three sources then for the gospel of Matthew. Matthew's unique material, material from Mark, and material from the Q source. If we think about the authorship of Matthew, and while Matthew makes the Gospel of Matthew attributed to Matthew, there's no internal claim of who wrote this, that a man named Matthew wrote this. So, but for just the ease of this exercise, we will call the author of Matthew, Matthew. But Matthew seems to be a Jewish scribe writing for Jewish Christians, or at least people who were familiar with Judaism. Remember, Jesus and all of his disciples were Jewish people, and the first Christians were all Jewish people. And Christianity quickly spread to non-Jewish Christians and non-Jewish people. But it seems that Matthew was a Jewish Christian writing to a Jewish audience. He's careful, for example, to show that Jesus emerged from the traditions of the Old Testament, tying Jesus back to Old Testament Jewish tradition. It also seems that Matthew was written sometime after the destruction of the temple. There was a revolt against Rome, and as part of the a Jewish revolt against Rome, I should say, and as part of the punishment, the Roman authorities destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. That happened around 70 AD. And so it would seem, the way Matthew writes about the temple, that this writing happened after the temple was destroyed, which would put it after 70 AD. Also seems some time has passed since the destruction of the temple. So some scholars have posited that Matthew may have been written around 85 AD. If we take it that Jesus was crucifi crucified around 30 AD, then you get some sense of the timeline. Jesus crucified around 30 AD, the destruction of the temple around 70 AD, and then the Gospel of Matthew being written around 85 AD. You get a sense of time, of how much time has passed from the time Jesus was on earth to the time that we are looking at the time of the, that Matthew's Gospel would have been written. So you might ask yourself, though, why would no one write these things down before 85 AD? Look at the time that had passed. Why not write these things down sooner? Well, there's two reasons. And the biggest one is that when Jesus ascended and returned to heaven, the disciples expected him to return any minute. When Jesus said he would return, they took that not to mean years, but days, weeks at the most. So why would you write down the story of Jesus when he was going to be right back? And even when 
days stretched into weeks, stretched into months, stretched into years, they thought it couldn't be that much longer before Jesus returns. But when it was obvious to the church that they were in for a long wait, they said, we do need to write some of these things down before we lose them, before, while the memory is still fresh. And writing was a big deal. Paper, well, they didn't have paper, but parchment, what they wrote on was expensive. It took an only educated, truly educated person to be able to write in a way that could be uh, passed down from generation to generation. And so between the idea that Jesus' return was any minute and the major production and investment of not only time but money that it would take to write everything down, the writing of these things took time. And so Matthew comes to us not necessarily as an eyewitness to Jesus, but rather as someone who's collecting what the church knows to be true, the collective memory of the church from Jesus' time on earth and writing those things down to pass on to us. We also see that given um, Matthew's apparent hostility to the Jewish leaders. Now, he, of course, himself was a Jewish person, as were the early Christians he was writing for, but he seems hostile to some of the Jewish leaders of the time. And because of that, it's likely that he was in northern Palestine, maybe even Syria, uh, to see if that situates him not only when he was, but where he was and where the church for whom God Matthew was written was. If he was in Syria, he was likely in Antioch, which had a large Jewish community and also a large Christian community after the birth of the church. So it seems that Matthew then was in the north of Palestine or maybe Syria or Antioch, specifically Antioch, writing around 85 AD as a Jewish scribe, probably writing for other Jewish Christians. And we look at some of the distinctives of Matthew that we'll look at as we launch into this time together. Uh, some distinctives of Matthew's theology. One is that Jesus fulfills the faith of the Old Testament. That Jesus did not simply come into the world in a vacuum, but that Jesus came into the world as the Jewish Messiah fulfilling what was promised in the Hebrew Scripture. Secondly, that discipleship and the church are important. So much of the Gospel of Matthew is directed at how we as Christians should be followers of Jesus. For example, the Sermon on the Mount, which we'll read about as we study Matthew, is about how do we live as disciples of Jesus. As disciples of Jesus, what do we do? And how we see elsewhere in the Gospel of Matthew, do we live together as disciples of Jesus and the church? So the second one is the importance of discipleship and the church. And then the third one is that the kingdom of God will reign in the present and in the future. That in Jesus, the kingdom of God broke through into the world but the kingdom of God in its full fruition will be at some point in the future. And the kingdom of God and kingdom theology is important in Matthew, which is our third distinctive. Well, friends, that wraps up our time for our introduction to Matthew. I'm excited to be in this process with you. Please, if you have any questions or comments, please email them to me and I will try to share them at our next uh, Bible study. You can email me at tsmith at centralmethodist.net. Again, my email is tsmith at centralmethodist.net. Send me those emails and I look forward to hearing from you and I'll see you next time.